All right, so I want to say a little bit more about arguments, and I also want to talk a bit about this rhetoric versus reason distinction that Lavin draws. I think it's good that he draws it. I think he needs to say a bit more. It's not super clear what this is or how to look out for rhetoric. Um, so but before we start, let's take a step back and just remind ourselves what an, ar ourselves what an argument is. You know, an argument's a series of statements premises that are supposed to give someone a reason to accept another statement, the conclusion, right? Here's a simple argument. It'll become clear in a second why I picked this one out. Um, you should put solar panels on your house because it's good for the environment and you will save money, right? You know, what's our conclusion here? What's the one statement that the other statements are trying to support? You should put solar panels on your house, right? What are the statements given in support of that? Good for the environment and it will save you money, right? Very simple argument. Maybe it's a good one. Maybe it's a bad one. You know, maybe it would save you money. Maybe it wouldn't. But this is supposed to give you reason to put solar panels on your house, right? No, no. One reason people make arguments, one reason we make arguments and people make arguments to us is to persuade us to do or believe something, right? You know, someone wants you to vote for their political candidate or join their religion or buy something, right? This isn't the only reason we make arguments, right? You know, you might make an argument for doing something and also an argument for not doing it just to see what the best course of action is, right? You might sit to yourself, sit down and make a long list of reasons to buy a new car and a long list of reasons not to buy a new car, right? Those are both arguments. You're looking, well, what's the reason to do this? What's the reason not to do it? What's the better argument? That will decide whether I should buy a new car, right? You might also make an argument, you might think about some claim that you don't necessarily accept and say, well, you know, if I believed this, what could I conclude from it, you know, what kind of argument could I make? That's another reason we make arguments. We might do that to try to understand why other people believe what they believe or, you know, just what some statement or some claim might mean, right? Anyway. All that's just to say, you know, it's really restrictive and not true just to say that arguments are only a means of persuasion because there are other reasons we make arguments. But one big reason we do make arguments is to persuade people, to get them to do or believe something. And when we use an argument as persuasion, an argument is a means of rational persuasion. When you make an argument or when someone makes an argument to you, they give you reasons to think that some claim is true or reasons that you should do it, right? Save you money, good for the environment, person is giving you reasons you should put solar panels on your house, right? But people often use non-rational persuasion. People often try to get us to do what they want us to do, especially when it's buying something from them, by non-rational means. Well, what do I mean by non-rational means, right? Well, we'll think of it this way, right? If, you know, if I make an argument to you, let's say a salesman comes to your house, right? I'm not a salesman, but let's say a salesman comes to your house and, you know, he reels off the advantages of solar panels. He's making an argument. But he's probably going to do a lot of other stuff to try to get you to do what he wants, right? He might, you know, if he's younger, let's say he's a young person and you're older, he might try to make you think of your grandkids, like when you talk to him, right? So that you feel some affection for him and don't want to disappoint him. So it's harder for you to say no when he tries to sell you solar panels, right? 
That is non-rational persuasion. You know, he's trying to remind you or whoever he's talking to of their grandchildren so they'll feel disappointment if they don't buy solar panels. In doing that, he's not giving you any good reason to do it, to think this is the thing you should do, right? Another thing salesmen will do, they'll ask you a series of statements that it's all very easy. You know, they start with statements it's really easy to say yes to. It's like, you know, do you want to help the environment? Yes. Do you want to, do you want to save money? Do you like to save money? Well, yeah, of course. Do you want to buy some solar panels? And, you know, like the, the thought's supposed to be... Yeah, I'm in the habit of saying yes, so it's going to be harder to say no to this one, right? They might flatter you. You know, a smart fellow like yourself likes to save money, right? You know. Also implicitly, you know, if you don't do what they want, you're a dumb fellow, right? All of this is non-rational persuasion. They're not giving you reasons that buying solar panels would be a good idea or that you should do it they're trying to manipulate you into doing it and when you start thinking about non-rational persuasion it's everywhere right um, political ads you see it a lot right you know they'll if it's an ad for a candidate he'll be there and there'll be like major key happy music they'll shoot him through a yellow warm tone filter if it's an ad attacking his opponent they'll shoot the opponent you know we'll see him or her in blue coal tones and eerie minor key music they might even slow their movements down so this person looks really menacing you know contrast that with you should vote for me because you know I'll make it easier to get health insurance and we all need health insurance or you should vote for me because I'll cut your taxes and wouldn't you like to have more money right that's giving you a reason to vote for this person just this major key happy music or minor key blue filter against their opponents that's not giving you a reason to vote against the opponent if they say well you know here's five times my opponents lied provably so don't vote for them because they're probably lying to you now then they're giving you reasons not to vote for this person that is rational persuasion now rhetoric is one kind of rash of non-rational persuasion Lavin talks about rhetoric that's the one we'll focus on but be aware that there are others you know as I said, you know, excuse my language, but one goal of mine in this course is for you to develop a better bullshit detector. Spotting non-rational persuasion will really help you do that. Now, what makes this hard? You know, Lavin just, you know, in, in the exercises, it's either rhetoric or reasons, but, you know, usually rational persuasion will be mixed right in there with rhetoric or other non-rational persuasion, right? Non-rational persuasion is not making an argument. Rational persuasion is. When the salesman tells you getting solar panels will save you money and help the environment, he's making an argument. When he tries to make you think of your grandson or you know somebody else you care about or make you think that he's your friend so it's harder to slam the door in his face, or when he flatters you so that it's harder to say no to him, that's non-rational persuasion mixed right in there with the actual arguments he's making. We'll see this a lot. And one thing we'll need to do, we'll need to spot non-rational persuasion. And basically, when we're evaluating an argument, we just ignore it. Or honestly, as we get more into this, we'll just cut it out, right? If you see rhetoric in an argument, you know, written arguments, rhetoric is pretty much the main, if not the only, means of non-rational persuasion. Just put a line through it and ignore it from them from then on. You know, in real life, try to tune it out, try to ignore it, focus on the rational stuff, right? S salesmen don't want you to focus on the rational stuff, right? Um, 
I've had a bunch of these guys come to my house and I'm like, look, do you have a brochure that has like the reasons to do this or a website? And I was like, no, we don't have brochures or we don't have a website. Because they don't, you know, I mean, maybe it's a good idea to add solar panels. I don't know, but the salesman does not want you to think about it and make the decision for rational remains, right? Which is one reason that I absolutely loathe salesmen. Another is they ring the door about 7.30, 7.45. We put our babies to bed about 7.30. So they've more than once woken my children up. So I, I just particularly hate salesmen. <laughs> Sorry, it's just a thing I've been annoyed about. One pretty good way of sorting out non-rational persuasion is that it's underhanded or manipulative. If you know that the other person, what they're up to, the non-rational persuasion wouldn't work as well, or it wouldn't work at all. You know, if you know the sales, if you realize the salesman is just flattering you because he wants you to buy something, that's not going to work. It's not going to work as well, right? If you know that he's trying to get you to think of your son or, you know, your grandson or whatever, ever, so it's harder to say no to him and disappoint him, that's not going to work nearly as well, right? If you know the tricks that a political ad does, if it's like, oh, you're just trying to get me to feel certain things with your happy music and warm tones or your menacing f scary scary music and your blue tones that's not going to work rational persuasion does not lose force in the same way when you know what the person is up to you know you know the salesman might not care one bit about the environment right he might drive one of those cars that gets like four miles to the gallon, fly everywhere he possibly can, just not care one bit about the environment. But if you do care about the environment, and he's telling the truth that putting solar panels on your house will help the environment, even if he doesn't care, that still gives you some reason to think this is a good idea, right? Or let me give you another example, right? You know, you might have had arguments about where to eat dinner, right? And my dad, when I was a kid, was the worst about this. He would always just kind of resort to guilt, right? You know, to, to eat where he wanted to eat. He'd be like, you know, you'd, you'd want to eat somewhere else because he's got to choose the restaurant like five times in a row. And you'd say, well, I know you like the buffet, but could we go, you know, could we get Chinese food? And he'd be like, all right, I guess. Right? Make you feel guilty which is non-rational persuasion playing on your feelings of guilt, right? You know, or on the other hand, if he were to say, hey, you know, the buffet has like fried shrimp and you can eat all the fried shrimp you want. You like fried shrimp, don't you? Even if my dad didn't care about how many fried shrimp young Sam got to eat and how much I loved eating fried shrimp, you know, he'd still be giving me a reason to like, you know, go to the restaurant he wants to go to different than just trying to guilt me, right? Once you realize someone is trying to guilt you, it does not work, or it does not work nearly as well. Now, one thing to keep in mind, even really bad attempts at giving reasons are different than rhetoric or other non-rational ways of getting the person to do or believe what you want, right? Let me, let me give you an example. When I was a kid, my, you know, we used to go, there was this, we'd, we'd go to the Smokies a lot, it was pretty near where we lived, and Gatlinburg, Tennessee is near the Smokies, and there was this mall that had a tobacco shop in it, a pipe shop, right, they didn't really sell cigarettes back in the day, and, you know, I was a kid, so I didn't buy anything, right, of course, but, you know, my dad would go in there and get some pipe tobacco, and the dude who owned the shop had this spiel, and it'd be like, well, you know... The, it's only the additives in cigarettes that cause cancer. Um, it's it's fine to smoke a pipe, right? Now, now that's nonsense, right? It is not fine to smoke a pipe, right? Pipe tobacco causes cancer too. This guy is either just very much misinformed or lying to his customers, or maybe he's misinformed and doesn't want to be better informed, right? 
pipes. Smoking a pipe doesn't cause cancer, so it's okay to smoke a pipe, so you should smoke a pipe, is a terrible, terrible, terrible argument. But at least, it's a terrible argument because the, the main premise is just false, right? Obviously false to a little research. But it is at least an argument. If it were true that pipes didn't cause cancer, it's not, they do. But if it were true, that'd give you some reason to think, well, okay, well, maybe this is better than smoking cigarettes, right? Contrast that with the Marlboro Man ads, right? I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember these, but if you don't, Marlboro Man ads were just these ads for this really rugged, you know, manly cowboy would be smoking cigarettes, you know, and, and the thought was, you know, You'll see the Marlboro Man. The Marlboro Man is this idea of manliness. You'll associate smoking Marlboros with being manly in the way the Marlboro Man is manly, so you'll go smoke Marlboros, right? Those ads are not even trying to give you a reason to think you should do it. They're just trying to get you to feel something and to associate Marlboro cigarettes with some ideal that maybe they presume that some men like, and we'll go buy cigarettes, right? Pipes don't cause cancer, so smoke a pipe is a really bad argument. It's a really bad attempt at rational persuasion, but it is still an argument. The Marlboro Man ads are not. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. A lot of times people will have trouble seeing... People are good at seeing that good arguments are good, you know, are actually arguments, but sometimes when faced with a really lousy argument, they'll be like, well, that's just rhetoric, that's non-rational persuasion. And it's like, no, that's a stupid argument, but it is an argument. Now, there are a lot of kinds of non-rational persuasion. You know, I think in these days of the internet, most of us are a lot better at spotting them than we used to be. We're pretty savvy about ads. It's almost like an arms race between us and the ads. We'll say like, hey, wait, this is what they're trying to do. You're not going to get me. And they'll come up with a new way of getting you, right? But it's good to train yourself and to be on guard for them. Um, my absolute favorite example of non-rational persuasion I, I ever heard about from a student was apparently some clothing stores had found that people were more likely supposedly to buy clothing when they smelled certain things so they would very subtly pipe certain smells into the store, right? Trying to get you to buy clothes, they're not giving you a reason to think you should, they're just trying to get you play on your feelings or play on whatever unconscious process to get you to buy clothes. I don't know. Maybe that didn't work as well as it was supposed to because like every time I go in a clothing store now, I'll be like, <laughs> like sniffing around. I'm like, I don't smell anything. So maybe that one just didn't pan out. We will only focus on rhetoric, though. You know, we're going to focus on written and spoken arguments. Rhetoric is the main thing you will see there. It's pretty close to the only thing. All right. So how do we spot rhetoric? Well, we'll do some practice with this. But first, I'm going to walk in the next lecture. I'm going to walk you guys through an argument that uses a lot of rhetoric just to give you guys an idea of how this works.